Good morning, Wumpo. Good morning, Ajahn Asamko. So, thank you again for this opportunity. Today is uh, Thursday, the 29th of April, 2021. And today, the question someone has uh, conveyed is how does one distinguish between listening to the heart, following intuition and trusting awareness? Because following the heart does not always necessarily need lead to beneficial results. Following one's intuition can also sometimes lead to doubt, but trusting the awareness seems to systematically bring us to the right spot and see things clearly. But how does one distinguish between these? Well, in the first place, these are just words, concepts created by human beings, and they're pointed in our like the intellect is, is usually associated with the, with the brain, with the discriminating faculties of language, which is always, you know, very dualistic and, you know, right and wrong, good and bad, true and false, you know, everything has positive as it's negative. And, and, and that is, uh, you know, how we tend to judge ourselves and judge the world. So then intuition, as, uh, as I use the word, is like intuitive awareness, you can say. Uh, I use it synonymously with awareness. It's the ability to, to be here and now just being here and now and without, you know, judgmental, uh, without judging the situation. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's just pure conscious awareness, conscious intuition, that kind of where you're open to the moment is like this, you know, there's no, it's not, Judging is not saying it's, this moment is pleasant or unpleasant, right or wrong. It's like this. And then following the heart is very poetic. <laughs> but as you pointed out, it doesn't always have a good result. And I remember when I was a graduate student in Berkeley, you know, the people would quote the prophet, you know, Cahill Gibran's treatise called The Prophet and, and justify all kinds of behavior, just follow your heart and, and where reason tends to, you know, makes it, it's more on the feeling level. So in Buddha Dhamma, feeling, is impermanent and not self. You know, so wait in that, sukha wait in that, dukkha wait in that, dukkha matsukha wait in that, whether it's, you know, physical pleasure or pain or mental. You know, these are emotions, are sankaras, and they're not, not personal. They're, they seem personal. So, you know, we have certain tendencies uh, we inherit through our genes, you know, through our parents and through our, you know, the conditioning we receive through the, the family we're born into, the society that we identify with, the religion that we've been conditioned with, the culture, you know, so, you know, our sense of what's right and wrong, what's appropriate, inappropriate, acceptable or unacceptable is very much, you know, the, the, the intellect passing judgment. You know, this is unacceptable, is, you know, is, is, is a judgment, isn't it, about the here and now, or 
Uh, is, is this totally acceptable or partially acceptable? We have to use the words acceptable and it's positive and neutral and negative potentials. Uh, you know, so that's all proliferation, that's thinking. Thinking is, is all impermanent. You know, you can't, you know, the passing judgment is, is very much conditioned by how we've been programmed through our culture, through our religion. So, you know, some, and then following the heart is, is, you know, very appealing as a, as a poetic image. And rather than just following what everybody tells you to follow. But as long as it's about a feeling of right and wrong, good or bad, you know, then it then it's it's no longer awareness. It's it's more or less following some judgment you've made about the situation. And maybe the judgment is right or wrong. I'm not saying they're all wrong. Judgments are necessary in the material world that we live in. But it's not liberating because, you know, it, we become obsessed with righteousness, with, with uh, we become indignant at the corruption and vice and sins of the world and we, you know, we we have strong feelings, emotional reactions to to uh, things that we see and hear, smell and taste and touch. But what is aware? What what is aware of all these sensory experiences? Is like it's consciousness awareness or mindfulness, these are just words. And, and consciousness in, is, uh, you know, isn't created out of ignorance. Consciousness through the senses, the senses are, you know, we have sensory consciousness which we strongly identify with, so we we, you know, con what we see, conscious, you know, we're consciously aware of seeing and feeling and hearing and uh, through the, the forms of our, and the uh, experience of sensory uh, experience in the present, we're aware of it, which can be pleasant or unpleasant. You know, what you see can be beautiful or horrible you know, in terms of it, you know, the judgmental process. But the consciousness isn't judging it, it's the, it's the thinking mind that, that passes judgment. Because whether it's beautiful or ugly, they're, you know, all sankharas, good and bad, right and wrong, all these terminologies of uh, dualistic terminologies are, are all of them, the, the best and the worst are all conditions, all phenomena, all phenomena. So, you know, that what is aware of that? Can, can one phenomena be aware of another? You know, can one condition be aware of another condition? Can one sankara be, you know, form a judgment about another sankara? So, you know, they, you know, do sankaras, are they really, uh, you know, this feeling of vedana or emotion that strongly have a sense of personal identity, you know, seem very personal and private, a lot of our emotions, you know, we don't want anyone to recognize. So we've learned how to be socially acceptable, 
by not just following our emotions, no matter what we're feeling in a particular social situation. And, you know, these are, we're trained from childhood when, you know, not to follow our emotions, but to, you know, be positive and suppress the negative ones. But that's all conditioning. So when we, when we, but what is it that recognizes the conditioning? Is sati sampachanya, sati panya, or mindfulness and wisdom? And and you know, and, and this this kind of wisdom isn't about right and wrong anymore. It's about the way things really are. So. And the Buddha, you know, in his teaching, made that very clear. All conditions are impermanent. And then all Dhamma is not self. So based on Karani Cha, so Tama Anatta. Well, that, that <clears throat> you know, it, all Sankaras, all conditions, all phenomena is, is not personal, has no personal reality you know it's not it is very impersonal it's transient and grasping what is transient out of ignorance of it you know we we become what we grasp so you know that that's the cause of suffering grasping desires and so desire is a sankhara, is a phenomenon that, that uh, you know, can be witnessed, can be observed, not judged. Is desire good? It can be good desire, desire for the welfare of all sentient beings or desire to destroy the whole world, evil desire or good desire. but. In terms of bhavana or meditation, we're we're looking at desire not in terms of right and wrong, but in terms of anicca impermanence, dukkha unsatisfactory, and and uh, anatta not self. So awareness, all all the senses are in consciousness. You know, so all the, the, the seven billion inhabitants of planet Earth at this time and all creation, including the planet Earth, the sun and moon, stars, the universe, everything from, from the vast macrocosmic perception to the microcosms of just atoms and neutrons and things like that, you know, whether it's macro or micro, it's all phenomena arising and ceasing. So, you know, the macrocosm can't, you know, it, it, it can have views about the microcosm like we can have views about other religions or other political systems or and some are intelligent, well-informed views and others are very biased, prejudiced, ignorant views that, that we adhere to, you know, but the, the main, the problem of suffering is the attachment to views, to phenomena, that, that we create. So in terms of intuition, which is used like following the heart, so you oftentimes align with, with that kind of romantic image. Well, I'm using it in terms of, of this awareness, intuitive awareness, I use quite often consciousness, 
mindfulness, and then then the uh, like if if we have an intuition, should we uh, say something now, or should we just keep quiet? You know, we you know we we because of a certain conditions that exist in a social situation. This is, you know, thinking, isn't it? Am I, should I say something? You, you, you're still thinking that you're a separate individual person who needs to, should say something to put things right or to uh, make things clear or to um, affirm positive views that you're hearing or views that you agree with. You know, there's still this uh, this sense of a separate self of, you know, how, how I approve of what is being done or said or uh, how I personally disapprove. And you can, you know, you, you get a feeling in a situation where there's arguments. Two people are arguing with each other, you know, you you tend to take sides with one over the other. You know, prefer one view over the other view, and then you have the same feeling of, of aversion towards the other opposite view. So, <laughs> and you can be aware of that. It's like, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, awareness is aware, you know, you know it's a, it's by being aware of the way it is rather, but it's not judging it. So even if you d disagree with someone in an argument, or you're listening to two other people argue about something, and you, you agree with one and disagree with the other, there's awareness of that. It's like this rather than the other one's all wrong and he's he's stupid and and doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> you know, we might feel like that or think like that. But that's those are all creations of the mind too. There's there's sankars, there are phenomena that that arise and cease. So in Bhavana, in can be pasanized, this uh, kind of dedicated, intuitive awareness of, of using every situation just to, to, you know, whether it's pleasant or painful or agreeable or unagreeable or, uh, you know, right or wrong, you know, you, you, you can be aware that I think you're, when you feel somebody's wrong, you know, you can be aware that's a feeling that comes and goes. You don't feel that way all the time. And then we get into the subject of righteousness. And uh, right and wrong are very strong feelings. If it's right, then, uh, then and I agree with what's right, that seems absolute. You know, I'm absolutely right. And if you don't agree with me, you're absolutely wrong. You know, these, we put them in terms of making absolutes out of phenomena that are changing. You know, and so there's, this is suffering because Right, you know, right and wrong depend on so many conditions. Just in, in terms of this, like in this intuitive awareness or intuition, you raise the examples of agreeing or disagreeing with someone or in an argument between people. There's also another uh, type of situation where people sometimes wonder what to rely on to guide a decision in some situations where a choice has a much bigger impact in their lives. Such as, for example, I mean, it could be a change of, a change of careers. It could be whether to uh, move 
houses make a choice in terms of uh, medical treatment that might be uh, very important in your life, whether you decide to go with a medical treatment or just let things take their course. So some people, sometimes this sense of what to trust and where to go inside in order to make a decision what to trust. In that context, how do you differentiate between what you refer to as intuitive awareness and recognizing the things the way they are, the uncertainty of a situation, the need to find this kind of need, one feels a need to find an answer that will give us a sense of certainty. What is intuition? How to, f to follow one's heart in that kind of situation? Well, it's learning to trust the awareness and then the decision comes from wisdom rather than from conditioning. And how do you know it's wisdom then? Well, that's why you've got to trust. You know, it's, it's like, you, you know, you can be caught in doubt. Should I get this medical treatment or shouldn't I? Should I be vaccinated or shouldn't I? You know, and you can see it as doubt. But then on the, you know, then, you know, you, if you just open to doubt, and not just try to arbitrarily make decision one way or the other, oftentimes the answer becomes quite obvious what to do. And, uh, and you know, in, intuitive awareness allows us to, to, you know, to function. We aren't just, you know, immobile, a kind of uh, beings that that just watch everything change, you know, in some kind of very passive way. But but action is is a part of the human experience, you know. So these forms, right action, right speech, right livelihood, are part of the the path of liberation. But oftentimes, you know, this is where we, we, we need to doubt or question because we, we are informed by a lot of opinions, a lot of propaganda, a lot of biased views, prejudices, and, and uh, fake news, you know, that, that is available on the mass media and by the societies we, we identify with. So, you know, this is, we're constantly being influenced uh, with information. But in terms of bhavana, it's a, you know, the, 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 the ways to put it in the context of knowing it's like this. And then the decision will make itself, you know, what to do or not to do. Like when, when I was, uh, before I ordained as a Samanera, I was, uh, you know, teaching English in Bangkok. And, uh, and I had, I already had a airplane ticket flight from Bangkok to Calcutta into India. I'd never been to India and I had studied Indian culture and and history and religion in a, in a master's program in Berkeley. So, you know, so I'd always wanted to go to India and uh, find Indian culture very interesting. But I was meditating at Wat Mahantat in Bangkok and I was, you know, finding it quite helpful. And, uh, and I had this flight an airplane flight ticket to India and then I'd get caught up in should I ordain I wanted to ordain eventually but uh, should I go to India first or 
should I not go to India and just ordain? And uh, and I remember getting caught in in a lot of anguish, doubts, and try, in the, trying to decide what which would be the best thing to do. And uh, and one night I was in my room in, by myself, and you know I started feeling just this incredible desperation of having to make a choice and and an inner voice came up came out inside me and said shut up Nordain <laughs> now that wasn't like a personal choice in terms of right and wrong good or bad it just came from you know wisdom and that's what I did Would it have been unwise to go to India? I don't know. But the, the uh, you know, I might have been distracted there. Who knows what would happen if I, where I would have ended up. But in terms of insight, in terms of what to do, I trusted that because it, it wasn't just an intellectual should I or shouldn't I, it just, you know, it was quite rude, you know, told me to shut up and just do it rather than spend my time trying to figure out whether I should or shouldn't. So I've never regretted that. That was uh, an in intuitive insight. It came from, from the empty mind, not from the you know personal sense of right and wrong or or intellectual uh, proliferation. Did you recognize that as wisdom when it arose, or is this in hindsight that you recognized it was a w wisdom manifesting? I don't remember. I remember I. That's was the answer to the doubt. It just cut through the question. Yeah, it just cut through all this this doubting and wondering what's right, what's wrong, what should I do? Or should I go to India first? And I could always come back to Thailand. You know, you go endlessly on and on about uh, you know different possibilities, or uh, maybe ordaining in India or Burma or. Yeah, <laughs> and the mind proliferates endlessly about other possibilities. So, but, uh, you know, something, you know, that, that I can't claim as personal choice. But some people, uh, I've heard several people ask this question in this kind of situation, what if you don't have one of those voices coming up and cutting through all the doubt? How, how do you, where do you go as a refuge from the doubt or how do you navigate all the questioning and the anxiety? Figure it out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> if you're aware. You know, like anxiety or doubt. It's, it's uh, you know, this, this is the attachment to thought. You know, so you, you know, it's, it's witchy kicha, the third fetter, that, you know, blind attachment to thought always creates, well, in the future is, is very, you know, one's very anxious about the future. When you think about the future, you know, the predictions, um, you know, for the future are so dire now with climate change and political turmoil and, and uh, technology, who's, you know, and space flights and then what will happen to the planet in 2050 and, and 
you know, the feed, you know, predictions, you, you see uh, videos on YouTube about, you know, predicting the future. And, uh, you know, one of the things is modern technology is going to solve all cure cancer and make everything right. And I remember, you know, back in the 1950s, you know, and when I was a youth, you know, I thought by this time, by 2021, they'd have found a cure for cancer. You know, I could get a vaccination or a shot and cancer is cured, you know, or you can get cancer treatments that prevent anyone, you know, when you're born, you, you get a vaccination and that will stop any effort of uh, possibility of, of having cancer in the future. I mean, these are scenarios, dream scenarios, you know, hopes and desires and see, it's a bit disappointing after 1950s, this is 2021. <laughs> you know, cancer is still a big problem for people. You know, when somebody says they have cancer, you, you know, you feel it's a certain kind of dread in your stomach. Every time, you know, at my age, at 86, every time I have a physical checkup, I keep thinking maybe they'll find cancer, you know, inside, you know, I don't know what's going on in the internal organs. And they do this ultrasound at the hospital, where they have this machine where they, they, they apply it to your, to your, the trunk of your body and your organ, internal organs, and you keep expecting, you know, in 86, there's something going on there that I don't know about. And maybe, you know, it's pretty dangerous. But so far, you know, they've never found anything. But, but uh, you know, when I think about it, you know, about the future, what is, what is the future for somebody 86? Is, you know, death is the most prominent perception of the future the physical death of this body. And, and then what happens when you die? You know, you know, people ask me, what, what, when you die, what happens? You know, and, and, you know, I don't know because I haven't died yet in terms of physical death. But in terms of mindfulness, I'm aware not knowing is like this. And that leaves this, this wide open space to, to let things in that, you know, that where insight can operate in terms of action and speech. You know, an empty, an empty, something empty that it'll, you can, you can fill it with anything. And if you're just busy filling the empty space with a lot of rubbish, you know, you, there's no, wisdom can't manifest in any positive way. So, so you know, when we're anxious, suddenly worried about the future, we're, we're constantly filling our minds with fear, anxiety, and worry. And these, these are like, phantoms that haunt our lives, even when they're in very safe and pleasant circumstances. You know, why, why do people drink alcohol and take drugs? Why is there so much problem now in modern societies with drug addiction, alcoholism? Because, you know, it's, it's, it changes the uh, mental state because uh, the ordinary mental state is just this busy mind nattering on, worrying about the future or resenting past experience, carrying grudges, wanting to seek revenge, uh, self-pity, blame, blaming others. And then the future, you know, is 
the future kind of utopian dream is that everything will be set right. But the past is is a memory, you know. It's, you can't set the past right. It's you know you, you see a memory as a condition that arises and ceases, and that's what it is. And all your image imagination about the future are just images you're creating in the present. So in terms of wisdom, then you you know in terms of right uh, some identity or right understanding or perfect understanding is this open reality of awareness in which right action, right speech, right livelihood can, you know, can be recognized. And it's not a matter of just choices that that one makes, you know, uh, on a, some kind of personal level, it just, uh, you know, it's like a, a gift, you know, insight, something that that you, you know for certain that is that gets beyond doubt. You mentioned earlier not knowing and how the uncertainty of the future and recognizing that we don't know actually opens up the space. That's something that people generally find difficult to do. Yeah, because the, the desire is always to find an answer to every question, a solution to every problem, to name for every form. You know, this is, this is conditioning. Like nothing really is, exists unless we have a name for it. And, uh, you know, and then we, you know, every problem needs a solution. And every question you want an answer. So, you know, when people say, How are you, Ajahn Sumedho? I say, Fine, that's an answer. <laughs> but that's an habitual answer. I'm, you know, I don't want to tell people exactly how I feel every, every moment. It's just a way of a kind of, you know, rhetorical acknowledgement of existence. I remember one man I met years ago who was a very intellectually gifted person asked him how he is and he started telling me in detail and all I was wanting was just recognizing, you know, you, I see you, you're here and so forth. So fine is, is just fine really, but unless the person is really curious you know, because you're, you're having some medical problem and uh, I want to know how you are, that's a different thing, but it, you, you know the time and the place and the situation. And in, when I went to live in Borneo, in Malaysia, years ago, you know, and, and people, you know, they wouldn't ask me in Malay, you know, they, they'd ask me, have I eaten yet? And I kept wondering, why did they always ask me? Does <laughs> 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 that remind me for a meal? <laughs> because in, in the Western world, we don't say, have you eaten yet as a kind of rhetorical greeting. Or in Thailand, they, they, you know, one time I was learning Thai, you know, one of the monks said, uh, you're here. And then I said, well, of course I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, reacting in a, in a, in a way that is, is, culturally conditioned, so much of language is, you know, is, is, it's all culturally conditioned. Mm -hmm. 
So it's it's uh, you know like mindfulness, knowing time and place. You know, when you, when you don't know time and place, then you, you are, you know, a bull in a china shop or, you know, you're saying things that are inappropriate at the time. And and you've got to trust this, you know, this awareness of the situation is like this. And, uh, you know, in, in a, a meeting, like here at Amrabati, they have a lot of meetings you know, and and then I don't attend these meetings usually, but, but meetings always, you know, it's time and place. A meeting situation is like this. It's when it's senior monks meeting, it's like this. And when it's you know, senior nuns, you know, then you can't, you know, it's a different situation when the, you have junior nuns and and Anagari Khas, all meeting with senior nuns, it's like this. And so it's a way of, of receiving the situation in the present moment without judging it. Then have a, your position in that situation, you know your, your relationship to from junior to senior and novice to Mahatera and, and all that. And, what is appropriate to, to to bring up as a subject or what isn't, rather than just babbling out what you're feeling in the moment and totally unaware of how it's affecting others. So, you know, intuition, is, you, you, you know, you go to situations where you feel it's, uh, the vibrations are strange or evil, you know, I've been in places where I've just had this feeling that, that something terrible has happened in this place. And it's totally unrational, it's just a feeling. But there's nothing in the situation, you know, that you can see or hear that, that is evil. What is that, you know? But, you know, do you have to call it evil or do you just know in the time and place it's like this? And, you know, whether you stay or go is, is, is you know, more spontaneous. It's spontaneity that one responds to particular situations rather than just reacts out of habit. Otherwise, we're just creatures of habit, you know. We, you say this and I react to it. You criticize me and then I just react to it. Or I listen to it. It's like this. So, you know, then, then I can respond rather than just react to it. My reaction could be very, you know, uh, violent or harmful, just reacting to somebody criticizing me, you know, in, in terms of conditioning and position and character tendencies. You know, so everybody's very much aware of political correctness now, which also has its flaws, doesn't it? <laughs> It's hard to say anything directly without offending somebody. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is carrying right speech to, you know, without intuitive awareness. Sometimes, you know, you just feel that, that there's nothing to say or your criticisms wouldn't be appropriate at this time, even though they're valid. You know, so in relationship to other people, you've got to open to them in this open way, you know, not just react to them or come from some bias because you heard other people's criticisms of this person. 
because that affects how we react to people, like gossip and and uh, criticizing others and and so forth. You it you know if you aren't aware of how it affects you, you you tend to react to it. So you you know it's not spontaneity; it's just re reactivity. Okay, well, thank you for these reflections.